All right, there, I'm recording now. But yeah, we're in week two. Um, so I, like I said last week, I do an in-person class now at two. And today I was a little bit behind. I had to figure out some stuff on the projection system. So I didn't get out of there until 4.45. So I know my email was a little bit later than usual. I try to get that invitation email out about five, like an hour before the class. Um, but you can always on that on that Zoom invite, I think just put it in your calendar and it's always going to link to that meeting. So you don't really need to use the invitation, I don't believe. I think you can just use that like as part of your calendar and it'll you'll just automatically be able to connect. If that's not the case, let me know. But I think that's the way it's been in the past. Um, so a couple of things I like to cover in week two with my Zoom class is a, a couple of situations, right? Like that might happen. Um, for one, what if for some reason this has happened to me in the past, not very often, like once where my internet went out, I live out in Jamestown. So it's kind of sometimes, you know, wind can knock some poles down or something like that. And I could lose internet. It's happened. If that does happen, if you connect to zoom or whatever, and I'm not here, it wouldn't just be because I just up and decided to quit teaching class or anything silly like that. It would be because I had, you know, an internet outage. But what I'll do is I'll email you from my phone generally and like let you know, hey, my internet's bad. And I'll generally give you a way a longer heads up than an hour before the meeting. It'll usually be, you know, as soon as I find out. But that shouldn't happen. I'm just letting you know. So if you get an email, just always be ready to check your email, especially if you come in and you try to join a meeting and I'm not here, which, um, like I said, probably won't happen. But if so, just look right at your email because I'll usually give you like a heads up. Hey, I'm trying to get here on connected, blah, blah, blah. OK. Um, so um, other than that, um, the book, hopefully you can find the book. It is on Amazon. I did leave a link. If you look at eLearn, I just wanted to show you that really quickly. I'm going to go to Flickr. If you go to eLearn and um, if I go bookmarks to eLearn, I'm just going to look at our eLearn in photo one um, in zero zero on this main page here. Um, the supplies links not including the camera. If you're having issues buying and finding a camera, um, let me know if you're having issues uh, finding a camera. Um, but uh, everything here is, is is up to date as well. Like I checked it. Uh, so if you need any of this stuff, it's all there. The tripod cost did go up quite a bit. Like it's $35.99. I think last semester it was $28 or something, which is unfortunate. Um, there are other options. You can find tripods at garage sales. I know there's not a lot of those going on right now, but um, so there's your supplies links. And then also below that are my YouTube and Flickr links, right? So <clears throat> um, on that, especially YouTube, if you click on the YouTube link, and I'm not going to go heavy into this, but that's me with a beard. Um, I have like some videos of hockey you might see because my kid plays hockey. Um, but mostly I think I have those private. I don't know why those are up. Maybe I can only see those. I don't know. But mostly what you're going to see is you're going to see this Art 2265 playlist. And I'm going to start a new one. I'll probably get rid of these. This was from last semester. So it'll have the videos of our classes. OK, so all that is, like I said, is it's just a benefit for you if you miss something in lecture and you need to recover it. Right. If you need to look at it again. One of the things I have noticed, and again, I know I said this earlier last week, is Zoom has a tendency to people just turn the thing on and then they walk away. And I can't control that. That's that's on you. Um, the reason I know that is uh, just because of some of the questions I get. But that's OK. I mean, I'm not it's not a big deal. So that Zoom there is just or that YouTube is there if you need to rehash some things, especially next week. There's going to be a lot going over Lightroom, importing and exporting. And that's going to be a big deal on how to do that. And you're probably going to need to watch the YouTube lecture uh, parts of it to, to figure that out. Uh, so does anybody have any questions about anything overall before I really dig into what I'm going to talk about this week, about anything from last week or in general? Anything at all? 
No. Okay. All right. Well, this week, um, we're just, I'm going to do a brief overview of photography. Okay. And I'm not going to put you to sleep with it or anything. It's going to be a brief overview and kind of why we do this. Um, and, uh, we're, I'm going to show you how to upload to Flickr. Um, maybe like, I'm not sure yet. I'm, it depends on the time. Um, let me jump ahead really quickly to say that I assign things every Tuesday, and I, I want you to make sure you know this. I'm going to keep the schedule updated. Self-portrait I am assigning this week, and I'm going to go into detail about what I want on that. I'm not really that concerned about self-portrait more than anything, but just being an exercise and using Flickr, okay? I do I do like to see good work. Um, you can use your phone for your self-portrait assignment. Okay, if you're especially if you're not comfortable with your your camera, if you do want to use your camera and you have a DSLR, you can use it and you can use it in auto mode. You can you can use it in auto and just get it, you know, get used to you turning it on and using it. Right. So that's fine. When it comes to Flickr, there's a little bit of a learning curve on how to upload and create albums on Flickr. Because every week, what I want is I want two albums. There's two assignments that's not like that, but you'll know ahead of time on that. But almost every assignment, I'm going to want two albums on Flickr. One is going to be 30 images in a folder called working, but not just working. It has to be have the assignment name as well. So self-portrait working, and that will be your 30th out, uh, shots that you took, Okay. Then what you're going to do is you're going to pick your 10 best out of that, okay, out of that group. You're probably going to do it before you upload to Flickr, hopefully. And those 10 best, you're going to call self-portrait selects. And then that album is what I'm going to grade. That's the one I'm going to jump into and look at first on Flickr. Uh, a lot of times I'll look at your working folder first, but I don't grade your working folder. I look at your working folder more on how you shoot. And, you know, what are you doing? Maybe right. What are you doing? Maybe a little wrong, whatever. I look at that and kind of get an idea of where you're at. Okay. So you need self-portrait working, 30 images. Self-portrait selects, 10 images. Those 10 images come from your 30 images. It's not 10 new images. It's 10 images that you picked from your 30 images that you say are your best ones. Hopefully that makes sense. And that's what you're going to do every week. 30 shots on a digital camera, no developing, none of that stuff. Okay. You can edit if you want on your self-portrait. I'll tell you when I don't want you to edit next, next assignment. I don't want you to edit because I want to see how you shoot, but I'll, I'll talk about that one next week. Um, secondly, so I'm assigning self-portrait. I'm going to talk more about self-portrait later. Um, I'm assigning self-portrait today. It's not due next week on Tuesday. It's due next week on Friday by midnight, okay? So that means every assignment from here on out, I will assign on this, this Tuesday, and then you'll have a week and up till Friday of the next week to finish that assignment, okay? So that's like a week and four days or whatever that is, Tuesday, yeah, four days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, three, three days. Okay, that's what you'll have to finish that assignment, all right? So you don't have to worry about coming in on Tuesday or Zoom coming into Zoom on Tuesday and having your assignment for last week done. It's due the Friday of the next week. So not this week, Friday, next week, Friday. Okay. Just stop me if you have a question. Um, so that's just a little bit of a rehash of how things, how the flow goes in this class. Um, now let's, um, talk a little bit about uh, storage first, um, which is something I covered in the class. Um, so um, first of all, photography has changed quite a bit, right? Over the years, but in a lot of ways, it's not, it stayed the same. The way it works is the same as it's been for the last 200 years. As far as the numbers go, the apertures, the shutter speeds, all that stuff's the same. It has not changed. The only thing that's really changed is what it's being recorded on. Okay. That's the big difference between digital and film or wet plates from the 1800s. It's that now it's recorded on a sensor. 
Um, that's it. Um, and not to try to oversimplify it, but the camera itself has always been, you know, minus like all this digital stuff on the back. When you turn it on now, you get a menu and all that stuff. But the camera itself is just a box, okay? It really is literally just a box, a dark, light, tight box that has a hole in it, okay? And inside that hole, it has a sensor now, and mine's mirrorless, okay? My sensor's right there, and it has a lens on the outside of it, okay? It's just like the human eye. It's the same idea. The lens has an aperture that opens and closes, wider, bigger for more light, tighter for less light. So when, just like the human eye, when you walk outside and it's really bright and sunny, your pupils without your, you don't, you know, it's just, um, I forget the word for it. It's uh, not purposeful. It just, they close down. Um, they close down because there's too much light. When it's dark, your pupils open up. It's the same way with a camera, but with a camera, you have to tell it to do this. And that's what we're learning in this class, okay? That's one part of it. The other thing this has in it is a door that opens and closes, okay? It's called the shutter. So the door, when it opens really fast, it's not gonna let a lot of light in. When the shutter opens slow, it's going to let a lot of light in. That's the other, that's the other part of that. The third part of that is the sensor itself. It's like you have something called the ISO, which is the brightness or darkness of the screen. Um, and in that way, you can turn it up, the ISO high, and it's more sensitive to light. You can turn it down low, and it's less sensitive to light. Okay, that's called the ISO. Um, and I don't, I'm not diving into that too deep right now because I'm going to have lectures specifically on each one of those features as we go on. OK, but that's those are the three things. Um, so. A lot of people, when they shoot on these cameras, they just use their card and they kind of store it on the car, their images on their card. They keep it on there. They do another shoot and they just keep everything there. We don't want to do that in this class. What we want to do is keep our card clean. And, you know, this is kind of up to you. These are just kind of work habits. But you don't want to save your photos on the card, all right? You want to save your photos on an external hard drive or at the very minimum on a hard drive on your computer. I would highly suggest storing them on a hard drive off-site, off of your computer. But that's me and, and this a lot of other people. But you don't want to store a lot on your computer. Um, it slows it down. You, you really want to use external hard drives as much as you can. And when I say external hard drives, they don't have to be like this, like these are really small. Even a flash drive works, like those little thumb drives, anything besides keeping it on your computer, okay? Um, so the other thing in this class, once we get going, is we're gonna be shooting in RAW, okay? Which is a format of a, of a photo, okay? The reason we shoot in RAW is because it, ha it keeps all the information in the photo. When you shoot in RAW, Everything that you record is being, everything that the po camera can possibly record is being recorded and it's being written to disk. Okay. The, the, the other option is JPEG, which is a compressed format, which means at that point, what the camera does is slide it down, cuts it down, it compresses it, it keeps it small. Okay. It keeps it, it, keeps it streamlined. But the problem with that is when you edit it, you don't have as much leeway in your editing. You don't have as much leeway if you're a little bit underexposed or if you're a little bit overexposed. With the JPEG, you can't get that back a lot of times. It's just not there. It's just gonna go away. But with RAW, you have some leeway because there's layers inside of that RAW. A lot of times there's a lot more information and it's a lot easier to push and pull things, okay? So that's a little harder of a concept to understand maybe, but all I mean by that is, we want to shoot in RAW to get as much information as we possibly can. So how do we do that? How do we shoot in RAW? Um, and again, we don't have to start shooting with these right now. But on most cameras, and again, this is a, one of the drawbacks of being online, is I can't handle your camera and see. But most cameras have what's called an 
IQ and my battery's about to die. So I might have to switch to the other one, but I had two batteries in here. You have something called IQ. Let me go to my other one here. IQ stands for image quality. So if you're going through your menu system and you have a setting called IQ, that stands for image quality. And you're gonna see when you look at that, I gotta find a good battery here. When you look at that, um, there's gonna be options for you to set it at JPEG, RAW. Sometimes you can shoot both JPEG and RAW. That battery's almost dead too. Batteries are a real problem, especially for Fuji. Fuji's batteries do not last. It can be a real issue. So for, and me, of course, I've got like 10 of them. So I've got to find one that's got some power. This one does. Okay. So what I'm just going to show you on my Fuji, even though I know none of you are shooting Fuji, but IQ is a pretty much, it is kind of an industry standard. If I hit the menu button on my camera, I'm going to hold this up. I have this thing called image quality and it's the top of the, it's the top of the heap there. Okay. And I don't know how well that's exposed for you all, but it says image quality. And with my thing, it's kind of hard for me to move my thumb thing, but I can move this around, but I already have mine set up for raw. But if I go through here, it says fine, which is kind of like a small JPEG. Then there's normal which is a medium sized JPEG. I, I honestly, I never shoot in JPEG because I think those words fine and normal aren't very specific. I don't like it. Fine is probably more tight, uh, higher res JPEG, if I'm honest, uh, like I think it is. And then normal is like your more uh, smaller JPEG, a less, less file size JPEG. Then you can shoot fine plus raw, which means you can shoot a JPEG and a raw. What it's going to do is just give you two of the exact same image. One's going to be in raw. One's going to be in JPEG. That to me is just a waste of SD card space. Some photographers use it to back up their photos with a JPEG. I mean, that's perfectly okay if that's what you want to do, but I would just go straight down here to raw. Okay. And then you just click that and you go, boom, and you're in raw and you're going to shoot in raw. And like I said, next week, we're going to talk about that more. Okay. So don't, don't worry if that's kind of over your head right now, that's okay. But we want to shoot in raw because raw is the highest quality image we can get out of our cameras. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right. All right. So why, why raw? I kind of told you. But if you if you think about social media like Instagram, Facebook, whatever, I know a lot of people don't use Facebook anymore and I don't blame them, um, you know, but if you take a photo and you love that photo and it's a great photo and you have to ask yourself at that point, what is the end result of this photo? What, what where is this photo? How is this photo going to be viewed? It's a big question. If you're a photographer, is it going to be viewed as a print? Hardly ever anymore, unfortunately. I like prints. I have prints hanging up. Printing used to be, and in my opinion still is, the best end result for a photo is a print, okay? But the day and age we live in now, most people are looking at photos on their phones and it is what it is. They're on a three or four inch screen and they're looking at the photo. Maybe they're zooming in a little bit to look at it, whatever, okay? A print in person is a really great way to look at an image. Um, but again, maybe that's just the old guy in me. Okay. It might be, but I still believe that either way, when it gets to Instagram or it gets to Facebook or where Flickr, it's gotta be cut down. It's gotta be compressed into a JPEG. The internet will not take raw files. It's doesn't, it knows what raw files are, but if you go to like if you go to Facebook or Instagram and try to upload a raw file, I don't even think you can upload a JPEG to Instagram it, from a camera. It has to usually be from a phone, straight from the phone, which it is a JPEG, but it has to be from the phone straight to Instagram. My point is social media sites or wherever you're uploading your image, they want JPEG. Okay. And that's fine. It's a universal format. It's a compressed format. The reason they want JPEG is very simple. It's in smaller, more streamlined file, and it's better on the bandwidth. These companies do not want to pay lots of money for 
millions of people to upload huge high res images to their websites because it would just kill their bandwidth usage and just be really expensive for them. Um, like YouTube's operating cost is astounding, I'm sure, because of how much, you know, bandwidth space they need to use every day because video is huge. OK, which we probably know that, but video is way bigger than photography, photo. All right. So the reason it, a JPEG is good is because after you're done editing, then it's fine. You just don't really honestly want to edit initially a JPEG. You want to edit a raw file. And then when you once you get it to where you like it, then, yeah, then change it to JPEG and it's fine. But don't plan on editing it a lot after that. OK, that's kind of the point of that. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Um, and I'll show you the difference between raw and JPEG next week a little bit, just like how how it edits a little bit. Um, so that's that. Now, as far as I'm jumping a little bit here, but I'm going to go back to cameras. OK, how does anybody know when photography started, like when it came about? Anybody have an idea? about when it happened, when like photography, the first photograph was taken. Anybody know? I thought it was like the 1800s or 1700s. 1800s. Yeah. Mid 1800s, about 1850, 1860, right around the civil war in the United States. So yeah, you're right on the money there. Um, but there was a concept long, long, like a, like a thousand years even before photography that was photography, just not, not with film or anything to record, okay? But first, let's go back to the 1800s. The first time you started seeing photography was around the 1850s, 1860s. Lincoln was president. Um, you see a lot of Civil War photos. Those are some of the, it's the Victorian era. You see a lot of images back then. What it started out was, oddly enough, or not oddly enough, were boxes, okay, with, with light safe, no light leaking into them, and a hole in the front. And then eventually lenses were screwed on to make that a little more detailed. The lens helps sharpen the image that comes in. But it's just a box, and they would have a hole in it, and inside the, the light, and it's kind of weird, like, I'm not going to pretend like I understand physically how it happens. I probably should know because I'm a photographer. But what happens is whatever you face that hole at, okay, wherever the light is, just like our eyes, the image somehow comes into that hole, into an angle, into that hole, and then angles back out inside of the box and projects itself onto the back inside of the box. Now, it doesn't project itself perfectly like the spitting image of that image. It's inverted, like upside down and backwards, and its color and everything is inverted as well. All the color and everything is inverted. It's the opposites. It's very strange, but it that's the way it works. So the first thing I'm going to show you very briefly here is what that um, what that was called, okay? And, and I'm just going to Google... And um, we're gonna go, and, and again, like I said, this is very briefly, but it was called the camera obscura, okay? And what the camera obscura was, okay, is, uh, I'll allow that, is this. And I'm just gonna go to images and I like to go to this one, okay? Cause here we have some Renaissance era person, right? And like, so this is, let's just pretend, I don't know what year this was, but it was probably in the 1400s literally could have been that long ago or even longer ago, okay? And what painters would do would build these boxes, like not little handheld boxes, but big boxes that you could step into, okay? And they would make them light tight, except for that little hole that you see there, right? And what a painter would do is get a very rough, because it was very rough, because this, again, is not a lens, it's just a hole, so it would be kind of blurry, kind of not great focus or anything like that, but it would project the image upside down and backwards onto the back of this wall in here. So the, the artist would kind of, like this person here, is step to the side, get out of the beam of the light, and then put whatever they are painting on, like say a canvas or whatever it is they're painting on back here. 
and sort of sketch out, uh, even though it's upside down, sketch it out and get their proportions and everything correct, right? And then once they got that done, they would take it out of there and sort of paint the painting. And this, I, I even honestly, I think the Greeks did this, okay? This, this went on for a long time. So this really was the sort of, you know, progenitor of photography was this camera obscura. It was called the camera obscura, okay? And the only difference between a regular camera, even maybe in the 1860s, was what it was being recorded on. They hadn't figured out yet how to make something light sensitive that could absorb that light and sort of trap it and keep it like that. Okay, so what they did is they used their hands and a brush or a pencil and reciprocate or copied it as well as they could with their arms and their, you know, just manually. Okay, I'm sure that makes sense. And that's, it, it's actually kind of cool because they went from that to, um, you know, and you'll see them, the history of the camera obscura. And there's a lot of examples of this. You'll see, you know, and you could use it today, you know, and, and some people do, but uh, as far as you could do it if you wanted to paint like that. It, I'm sure people do. Some of them still do. Um, so anyway, and like I said, I'm not going to get super long winded on this, but then it went to like uh, daguerreotypes. Okay. And I'm just going to show you that right here. And I can never spell this word daguerreotype. It went to daguerreotypes, which all you all have seen, I'm sure in the past. Um, and these are sort of what you get now they started, they figured out that tin, okay, would react with egg white and some other things chemically and would absorb light and keep it. So what they did is they started making these daguerreotypes and they found a chemical process that would keep it recorded with silver, tin, egg white. There's a, I've never really dived too deeply into this and I, I kind of like to because it's really cool and people still do it, but I haven't. So I'm not an expert and I would never pretend to be in this, but they started to get to a point to where they could record on the metal, okay? And what you'll see a lot of times, and this is a good example of Victorian era photos was a really stiff kind of portrait. And what I mean by that is if you look at his face, he just looks like he's really trying his hardest to hold really still. And he is because these exposures would take about 10 minutes, OK, meaning he had to sit as still as he possibly could for 10 minutes while this metal absorbed this light. OK, it was took a long time. All right. Ten minutes to sit still and not move your face is a long time. Um, and that's why you see in a lot of Victorian era photos, um, people look quite uncomfortable. Um, and plus, the time was different, too. People were just, I mean, compared to nowadays, people were strange, you know, in some ways. But I love Victorian era photos. They're really kind of creepy in a way, you know. But um, you'll see that a lot of people look really stiff and uncomfortable, okay? And also, Victorians, you know, take this for what it is, would photograph their dead a lot of times, which is a real taboo nowadays. Um, but they would. Uh, it was kind of like, and when photography came about, that was one of the first things they started doing quite a bit. I'm not saying this, this guy's probably alive, but sometimes you'll see things and you won't even maybe know. Um, but it, it's, it's kind of a strange thing, but my point overall on that is it was a really long exposure. So keeping all that in mind, that was from the late 1860s and technology, as hopefully we all know from about the late 1800s to the early 1900s really started skyrocketing fast. You had, you know, electricity, Benjamin Franklin kind of discovered electricity, you know, take that for what it is, understood it. They knew electricity existed, but Edison and Tesla um, really understood how to harness, started to understand how to harness electricity. But all this stuff was happening in the early 1900s, late 1800s, industrialization, Cameras really progressed quickly. And the main thing that progressed in cameras in that era was we had we we found film. We invented film. And film, even though it's dated now, could make an exposure in less than a hundredth of a second. Okay. So it could just boom and it was exposed. Okay. And that changed everything. And I mean really changed everything scientifically engineering everything changed because of that because if you think about it 
It was the first time in recorded human history where we could literally document something that was happening in front of our eyes and exactly represent it. Not with a painting, not with a drawing, not with something that took hours. Boom, instant. So think about slow motion nowadays. But if you could see a horse in mid gallop, you could see exactly how that horse worked, how its muscle system worked. You could see a droplet hit water, you know, a droplet come down and, and, and expand. You could see how a machine would work in mid motion because of photography. So it, revolutionized science um, in many, many ways, okay? So it went from that, from the early 1900s all the way to the early 2000s, 100 years, okay, film. And then in the early 2000s, late 90s, but really it didn't get good until around 2010, 2012, okay? But digital came about. What did digital do besides, and this is kind of what, I like to say this because a lot of people think, there's such this big jump between digital and film, but there's really not. All digital did was change it from film to onto an electronic sensor. So now it's being recorded onto a sensor, which has little light refractors and things that record the image inside of the sensor. And it just immediately becomes a digital file. Okay. But other than that, nothing changed. Okay. And I, and I mean that sort of overall right yes yeah now you have a screen you can see the image which is amazing and great okay there's there's things that changed along with that because of digital but as far as how the camera operates it's the same okay lenses operate the same way uh shutter speeds and aperture and iso even operates the same way the numbers are all the same and and i i touched on that a little bit last week but if i handed this camera to somebody who, who who was a professional photographer in the 1970s and passed away 20 years ago, um, if I handed them this camera, they could use it. Uh, it would take, they'd be amazed by the screen, but they could use it because everything number wise, they'd be like, they'd be familiar with it. They would, they would understand it. So that's kind of a cool thing. So don't think you're learning, in a way you're learning an old technology, but it's not something that's um, obsolete by any means. Um, and also with the phones, it's not obsolete, mainly because of lens, lens accessibility and all that. So, and we'll talk a lot about that. Okay, so does anybody have any comments or questions about that? Just kind of a brief, brief rundown on how photography sort of changed, really brief. Um, okay, so the next thing on that is auto versus manual. And why would we choose one over the other? And some of you may know, some of you may not. Well, auto, in every camera, there's something called a light meter, okay? And what that does in, in every camera, there's one in your phone as well, okay? There's one in every camera, especially nowadays. Back in the day in film, sometimes you had to have one that you would hold in your hand outside of the camera, but not anymore. Now they're all in cameras, okay? It's called a light meter. What a light meter does is even like when I turn that screen on or off, Light is very, very measurable, okay? And it's very different than what you might think between one situation and another. And what I mean by that is um, if I um, shut my computer down here and you're looking at me right now and I have a PC over here with just a monitor, okay? And I'm gonna shut it down really quickly just to maybe, okay, it's on the dark screen now, but that light just changed really and very minor but that light changed there you there was more light being shown on me over here just from that that monitor those things matter in photography and it's very subtle and the human eye a lot of times doesn't notice it and why don't we notice it mainly because our eyes are so biologically adapted to seeing so well that we just adjust so quickly and we see exactly what we need to see so when we walk into a room that might be a little bit dark to us, no big deal. We can see everybody fine. And I talked about that in the classroom. It looks fine in there. But if you take a camera, it's very low light. One of the first things with new students with photography is they think, oh, man, I've got plenty of light. And they really don't. There's not enough light. And I will say this kind of as a warning and not in any is if you shoot, if you want to, and it's cold outside, I know, but if you shoot a lot inside in your house 
you have way less light than you think you do. Trust me on that. Like you have way less light than you think you do. If, if you're shooting under just standard light bulbs and things in your house and you've got curtains in your house, you don't have as much light as you think you do. Your eyes tell you you do, but you don't. Um, and you'll see that. And one of the reasons also that people fall into that pitfall is because we're so used to using phones now and they have such bright and everything comes out so bright and it's great. I'm not again, it's great. But the phone, the auto mode on the phone just knows, boom, I'm going to make it super bright for you. It just thinks for you, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. It just That's what it does. But if you're doing it manually, you have to understand that you have probably way less light than you think you have, okay? So just remember that. And I'll, I'll talk about this as we go through the class. Um, so does anybody have any questions? It's just a little, again, these are just brief things. Um, so the next thing, okay, now how do I start this? Um, okay, what is, what is the most important thing in a photograph? Okay, now sometimes you're going to hear my opinion and you don't have to agree with me, okay? I don't expect everybody to do what pleases me in this class. You don't have to take photos to make me happy, okay? You, meaning you, you take photos for what you enjoy. There's a caveat to that though. The caveat is you have to make photos, and I say make, and I'm purposeful when I say that, that you when you when you make that photo, you, you should think, is this visually interesting? Is this visually interesting? That is the hardest part of photography, okay? It's to make something that really is interesting to other people. Now, when I say this, um, I don't mean this to be judgmental or anything else, but when I say this, what I mean is, like, I'm just going to go with this. If you see a picture of a person on Facebook that took a picture of their lunch, and I'm just throwing that out one of the most benign examples, um, unless they're like a chef or something, in it, or it's like squid or something weird or really offhand, let's be honest, nobody really cares, okay? And I'm saying that the nicest way I can. And what I mean by this is content, Okay content matters. Now we all live in Dayton, Ohio, right? What's here? We all live here. Now, if you get in your car and you drive a, mi a hundred miles north to a city you've never been in, all of a sudden you see all kinds of cool stuff because you've never seen it before. So it's hard to find things that are visually interesting if we trap ourselves in this mentality that we're too familiar with this place in these areas. So hopefully you're jiving with me on this, uh, jiving with me, staying with me on this. The point is, sometimes we don't need to be objective in our photography. And I really mean this. And what I mean by that is, if you see a car driving down the street, don't just take a picture of a car driving down the street, okay? Unless it's just an exercise, okay? Take, if you're gonna take a photo of a car, get up under the car or get like kind of at an angle of the car that when you look at the photo, you might not even know it's a car. Okay. That's kind of what I mean by this. And I'm going to take it another step further. Picture this. I give you an assignment and I say, I want everybody to go to the target parking lot and take 30 photos. And that that's not an assignment, but let's say, let's say it was, and actually it might be a decent assignment because what's my point of that assignment? Um, you're going to go to the Target parking lot and I want you to take 30 interesting images. Now, that's hard. And I'm going to, why? You probably all know why, because a Target parking lot's boring. We've all been to it. It's a bunch of cars parked there. There might be some shopping carts, some lines on the pavement, whatever, okay? But a good photographer... And I mean that in, in some relative way, but a good photographer will find 30 interesting images in a Target parking lot, trust me. And what I mean by that, yeah, I thank you for the thumbs up. And what I mean by that, and that's the mindset that I'm trying to get you thinking about early, okay, is that you don't have to be objective about everything. You don't gotta have to go, oh, there's a car. Oh, there's a car. Oh, there's a person. 
one of the things a lot of people get trapped in is they put everything in the middle and that the thing that's important in the photograph is right there in the center. And look at that. You'll see it all the time. Look at some of your friends' photos when they go to the beach. And again, I, anytime you hear me, quote unquote, kind of making fun of other photographers, please take it with a grain of salt because I'm not trying to be mean or cruel to other people. I'm really not. I'm just trying to separate what is a good photo compared to what is a not so exciting photo. That's all I'm doing. Um, but if you see a lot of your friends go to the beach, maybe you've done it. I've probably, I've done it. Go to the beach and then you're, you, you know, your mom's with you and you take a photo of your mom on the beach. You put her right in the middle. She's kind of a little bit too far away. You really wanted the sunset a little bit too. It comes out. It's not that great of an exposure. She's right in the center. She's too small. We've all seen this, right? And then you end up going, you swipe right past it. It's not a good, it's not visually grabbing me right? That's, that's it. So what I want to do really quickly is I'm going to go to my, um, and I didn't do this with the other class because I couldn't get the projector working, but I just want to show you, I'm going to go back to the target parking lot really quickly. And I'm going to show you what I mean by, there was a guy named Jermaine Mukes that I had a few years ago and he did this. He went to the target parking lot and he took really mundane pictures of things like this and he was very successful because he, he saw beyond the mundane, okay? That's the best way I can say that. And if I go to his albums, and he is a photo student. I don't know if he was at the time, but he ended up getting into it. But it was into the night, I think, right? Was it into the night? Um, let me just find. He might have gotten rid of it. If he did, I have it on my... Um, I have it on my... Uh, um, examples. Yeah. End of the night. Okay. So a couple of these, you know, and this is, this is a project we do end of the night. A couple of these, this isn't a target parking lot, obviously. Right. But he was doing these floral type shots. I know I'm going through them kind of quickly, but then he got to this. Okay. So this one is kind of standard, but I love the way it's kind of lit under the trees and he was looking at light and it, it you know, it is what it is. It's a decent photograph. But really, he's, this is where he starts getting into abstract, right? And yes, we know these are carts, but look at the way it's composed, right? In the top third, it's kind of like you have this bar across here. You have these nice beads of light here. You have this kind of boom, 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 these angular lines coming across. It's just carts in a cart corral, but it's a really well-made photo of carts in a cart corral as far as I'm concerned. You may disagree, I don't know, but for me, this is a good image, right? And he just did this with very mundane things like vacuum cleaners, because it's all about the light and how the light hits it and the composition and the color, the red here, the blue here, the brightness of it all, that kind of thing. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not gonna take a real deep dive into this, but what I want you to know is even like this, this is just like a grate, right? Like a water grate that accepts water on the ground. But why is it not maybe a, in just a mind-blowingly amazing image, but it's still, what does it do? For me, it presents a mystery, okay? And I mean that by, I look at this and it takes me a second, all right? I have to look at it and I have to go, hmm, what is that? Why is this going on? Why was this photo taken? You know, wh what's going on in this? And that's it, okay? And for more or less, there's mystery here. And when you do this, it doesn't really matter if it's the most mundane thing that you've seen a million times in your life. Double yellow lines on a road. We've all seen it. But have we seen it this way? Maybe we have, we probably have, but not that often. This is a nice photo. It's well composed. This kind of splits right in the middle, but it's it's good because this horizon line, these are called leading lines. We're going to watch video about this composition. But this is what makes a good photo is the mystery. Okay. And this one's a little more standard, but even this one, I can tell that he painstakingly looked to compose this the way he did. That and that's the thing about this class. I want you to know right off the bat, I don't expect every photo you take to be home runs, right? That are going to be what? Oh, that's so good. I know there's going to be times where not they're not all that great. What I also know as an instructor is that I can look, and trust me, I can. I can look at a series of 30 photos that you take, and I can tell if you spent five minutes in your backyard just trying to get it done because you were in a hurry, or if you spent some time like 
okay, maybe, maybe this way, or maybe I can tell. It's, it's really easy to tell just by looking at the image, especially for someone like me. I've been doing it for a long time. And I'm not saying that to scare you or anything like that. I'm really not. I'm just saying I can kind of tell that. So I want to tell you this. I would rather you kind of, you know, if you're, if you're a day late on something or whatever, if you're running a little bit behind, I would rather you take your time and do it right than rush through it in 10 minutes and just try to knock it all out. One of the big hazards people get into in this class is they don't leave their comfort zones, okay? They don't wanna leave their bedroom or leave their house. And it was a little bit worse when COVID was real bad. And I know it's kind of come back and I get all that. I understand that. Like, um, but to go outside, even to walk around at a park or walk around and look around at the world around you. And even though you've seen it a million times, Look for those little weird mysteries, like look for those little things that might just be a little bit off or a little bit strange. And even if they're not, compose them that way with your camera. Use your camera as a way to see things differently. OK, and that's enough of that. I don't want to pile all that on, but hopefully that makes some sense. Like you don't have to just say, oh, look, there's a tree, tree. OK, you don't have to do that. You can go up close to it and go, oh, there's the bark. And it looks like there's some weird slug that's been eating at the bark a little bit. And maybe if I get real close and go to an angle like this, it might be a different kind of cooler exploratory photo of the tree than just tree. OK, so that's that's where photography has kind of gone, unfortunately. But there's still a lot of great photographers out there still is probably more than there's ever been right? Because it's easier to do in a lot of ways. But because everybody's got one in their pocket now, they all just go, oh, you want to picture me? Me, tree, lunch, car, dog. We want to get away from that, right? We want to get away from that whole like real brief kind of interaction and get a little more invested in what we are photographing, okay? Um. So that's why composition and content matter. And I'm going to talk more about composition um, as we go on with this self-portrait assignment, which we're leading into now. We're about we're about done. I'll never really go longer than an hour and a half today. It's not going to be that bad um, on lectures because I don't want to put you all to sleep. But that's why composition and content matters. Now, um, there is a video, OK, that I'd like you to watch that's on the, um, I'm just going to show you really quickly on the e-learn. A lot of times I watch it with the class, but I'm just going to trust you all to watch it. Um, and, and I'm going to show you where it is here. I'm going to go to e-learn again. I know I kind of go back and forth on this and then we're going to talk about self-portrait and we'll be done. So when you go to, when you go to e-learn and you go to digital, your, your class, and I know probably I'm not the best instructor at laying this stuff out, but if you look at the left side here, and you go to composition. And I know it's a little bit below all this stuff. The DSLR, you can look at this. Okay. I, I, I explained that, but I'll talk more about that later too. But file management, we're going to talk about next week, very in depth. So the exposure triangle, we're going to be talking about in depth the entire semester. So these are just kind of overviews. But then if you go into composition, there's this really good video here. It's only like three minutes long, okay? It's called Nine Photo Composition Tips. Very, very nice little video kind of explaining composition. And then there's this also that's more about, the guy's a video guy, but it really is just the same with photography, okay? Video and photography go hand in hand, okay? They're, they're the same thing. One is just multiple photographs every second. But this is a very good video to watch as well. <clears throat> On self-portrait, like I've said, I've kind of, there is, I do have a, a video about really pro-looking self-portraits, okay? Um, and then I also have the student examples. And if you look at the student examples, I think I showed them a little bit last week. Most of them are not what I would consider your standard selfies, right? We want to try to get away from that as much as we can. But at the same time, my biggest thing is trying to get um, trying to get things up to Flickr. OK, so right now, I think I'm going to hold off on the Flickr lecture until next week. It's not that big of a deal. It's not going to take that long. 
The reason being is what I want you to do with your self-portrait assignment is I want you to just get the Flickr app on your phone, okay, and just stick with that. If you do want to use your DSLR, I don't care if your albums aren't set up correctly. The good thing is when I do talk about it next week, self-portrait won't even be due yet until Friday. So if you are going to use your DSLR, you will have this knowledge of Flickr by the time it's due, okay? I just want to keep on pace with the, the first class. So what I want you to do, I'm sorry I jump around, but I want you to get the Flickr app on your phone. Um, you can use a tripod for your phone. And I'm sure a lot of you don't have a tripod yet, but there are little phone holders that attach to tripods so that you don't have to hold the phone. Um, some questions that were asked in the first class, does self-portrait mean it has to be me of my face? No, right? Mm -mm. It doesn't have to be. It can be of your feet. Um, you saw those examples. It can also just be of what you're you're into. And, and, and that can get a little bit off the rails. But like I said in the first class, say you're a boxer, okay? It just came out of my head, like in the first class. And you're really into boxing and you do it five days a week. And you could take a picture of your boxing gloves hanging up on the wall, okay? Or if you're into makeup and you, you know, and you're into cosmetology, you could do something with, uh, you know, makeup, like maybe your rack of makeup and maybe your hand holding a, a brush or something. Those things are all okay. You don't have to necessarily just go, hey, this is me. One of the things about self-portrait that I want you to think outside of the box, and again, I'm not against this, it's just the way it is, is what do we do self-portraits for nowadays, right? We glamorize ourselves. And okay, okay, it's a useful thing, but it's how how rich are you? How beautiful are you? How, uh, how great of a vacation did you take this last summer? Um, how handsome is your husband or how beautiful is your wife or whatever, right? I, you know, for lack of a better way, but, and that's okay too. Okay. But maybe on our self-portrait, we don't need to say how depressed are you or how miserable your life is going. You don't have to do that. Right. Um, and I don't mean that to laugh at that. That's a serious thing, but you don't necessarily have to glamorize yourself is all I'm saying. I mean, it, for me, I don't usually, I, I don't like to look bad in photos, but I like to, I play around with light and how light works on my face. You know, I don't mind that I'm getting old. I don't mind that I look like an old guy. You know, I'm okay with all that stuff. It's part of life. So don't be afraid to look at yourself honestly is all I mean. And when you look at the self-portrait photos in the, in the student examples, you will see a lot of them that they look kind of pensive or, or and, and again, you don't have to do this because I'm telling you they have to be pensive. If you want to glamorize yourself, by all means, do it. That's okay. What I want you to, the one thing I do want you to try to step away from sometimes if you can, is not just doing this three feet away, my hands holding the camera, looking at the camera. And that's going to be the trick. How do you do that? Well, um, you can have somebody else help you and maybe like hold the camera up, um, but maybe more like full body shots of you in a scene, you know, or whatever it may be. I don't know. Hopefully you're not struggling with this too much because I want to tell you this. I don't really take this assignment all that seriously. OK, one of the main things is I just want you guys to get into the you ladies. It's all ladies now. And I say you guys, I apologize for that. But ladies is to get into the example or the. Um, the habit of getting 30 photos taken a week. OK, that's it. And um, getting them up to Flickr. So what I would like and again, we're going to talk about this more in detail next week is albums. We're going to have a working album and a selects album every time. All right. And the working album is going to have 30 photos. The, the selects album is going to have 10 and they're going to be 10 of the same photos. I know I've repeated that, but I just want to make sure you know, and you're going to put them on Flickr. Why Flickr? I know I've already said this too, but because I can see the settings of your camera, especially when we start shooting manual um, right now, it doesn't really matter as much, but um, hopefully this makes sense. I would love to see, this is what I generally see, and I'm just going to say this, is people that kind of do go ahead and, yeah, I'm going to do a good job on self-portrait. I'm going to make them interesting. I'm going to have fun with this. Those are the same students that throughout the semester usually do a good job on every project. Um, and I can't force you to enjoy this class. I know that. I know it's a prerequisite for this com. 
And, and I'm glad, I think it should be, I mean, photography is a very important part of the design. Um, but the main thing you can do to really make this class go better is to, before you do the project, think, well, how can I enjoy this? Like, how can I actually challenge myself a little bit and have some fun with this and not just go, oh, this is a burden and I have to get this done and this sucks, you know? And I have had students like that and I can see it in the work and, and I feel bad. I feel bad for them, um, but try to enjoy it. Um, and, and even with this self-portrait, you know, if, like, and this sounds kind of weird, but like if I had a hangnail and it was really bothering me and my finger, I, I could take a close up maybe photo of my hangnail and that's self-portrait. It's fine. Uh, you know, so th there's really a lot of things you could do. You could cut out pictures of your face if you had prints of your face and put, paste them onto dolls and, and do that. And that would be self-portrait. There's a lot of ways to think outside the box, even in self-portrait, if you want to. If you don't want to, then you could just go 30 times, click, 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 click. Maybe I turn my head this way. Then I turn my head this way. Then I go like that. And then I go like that. And then I go like that. Okay, I guess. But like try to maybe do a little more than that, you know? So um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, but the main thing of this assignment, most people do well on this assignment. I usually do give people tens that really kind of knock it out of the park. And generally the grades are between tens and eights on this. And eights usually whatever. And I'm not going to say, it's not like grading is a bargaining thing, but generally a 10 is somebody that really went out of their way and said, yeah, I'm going to have fun with this. I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to create a character. Or I'm going to have fun and do, you know, be creative with it. That usually will get you a good solid 10, you know, so it goes from there. I'm not a hard grader. Okay. I'm not, I'm not one of these, like, you know, looking at every little detail and trying to punish you for things you did wrong. Right. I'm not like that. Uh, but uh, what I really like to see is just a little bit of effort um, involved. And that's all. It's really not a lot of photos on a digital camera. 30, it's, it'll take you no time at all. A lot of times you'll have more than 30 and you'll have to get rid of some of them. Okay. And that's okay. Um, so with that being said, does anybody have any concerns or worries about, well, how am I going to, what if I do want to use my DSLR? Does anybody want to use their DSLR for the self-portrait? Well, I'm getting mine this Friday, so maybe I'll try a little of it. Good. Then that's okay. That's what I want to hear. Yeah. And if you do, Jillian, as well, and yes, if you plan on using your camera, please do. And I was going to tell you, Ali, if you... Use your DSLR and you've never touched one in your life or only maybe seen one a little bit. Have no, put it in a auto mode, okay? And just okay. use it, you know, and that's okay, okay? And even auto is not going to be perfect. It might, it might have a hard time if you're in a dark situation. So make sure to give yourself plenty of light, but put it in auto mode if you don't have any experience. But you can, you can more than happily use your DSLR. Now, as far as Flickr goes, it's going to be a little trickier for you to get it uploaded to Flickr. And that's what we'll talk about next week. It's not, it's not that big of a deal, but it'll be a little trickier. We'll get all that stuff worked out. But um, hopefully what I'm saying makes sense. Uh, you know, I, I, I want you to be excited as much as you can and enjoy it and try to be as creative as you possibly can. And I want that in every assignment. Um and like I said, I know I repeat myself a lot, but I know every photo is not going to be a home run. And I don't expect that. It's not a big deal. When you pick your 10, you try to get 10 home runs, you know, 10 of your best. You know, you don't want to take one that was like dark and you can barely see anything in the image. You don't want that in there in your top 10. But you just pick your 10 best. And uh, what I'll do sometimes is I, I actually every time I look at your working folders when I'm grading and sometimes I'll see, oh, I wish they would have picked that one because I really like that one. If I see that, I'll sometimes I'll consider it as part of your selects, even if you didn't put it in. You know what I mean? Like, so I'll go, oh, well, that's really good. Actually, I don't think they recognize maybe as much as I do what, how, how good that actually is. So I'll give you like credit sometimes on like what you might have accidentally or just purposefully left in your working. But that's part of the process. What What is that? Part, what is that is it's about self-critique, right? You say, well, which one is my best work? Self-critique. That's an artist has to do that every day. So 
but I look at those and sometimes maybe if you had seven that I thought were really good, but three that weren't so good, then I look at your work and go, man, I wish they would have put those three in. I'll consider that and say, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll just put, say, I think these should be, boom, you still get a 10, that kind of thing. And, and not to say that happens all the time, but that can happen. So um, I'm just trying to think of things that students think of. I've done this for a while now, questions they have, um, but just relax and, and, and don't be worried that you don't understand everything about your camera yet, because you're not going to, it's not a big deal. Main thing right now is look for that image quality. You want to set that to raw eventually. But right now, I want to say that too. You can shoot this first assignment in JPEG too, if you want. Self-portrait, you can shoot it in JPEG if you want. Because the raw, what we have to do is take it out of the camera, then convert it to JPEG through Lightroom, which you're not going to know how to do yet because I haven't shown you. So shoot in JPEG. If you're going to shoot on your G DSLR, shoot in JPEG for right now. Do your self-portrait in JPEG. Okay, your phone shoots in JPEG, so you don't have to worry about that. But uh, if there's anything you feel like you, you, you should have asked later, email me and I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, but uh, I think we should be okay. And again, we're going to touch on self-portrait again Tuesday, just to make sure we're all up to speed. And we're really going to dive into Flickr, file management, and Lightroom. Okay, and, and these are big deals. Um, Lightroom Classic, I'm going to show you that. Uh, these things we need to know how to do um, just to keep our files from not becoming a nightmare. And, 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 it does, and it happens very quickly with photography if you're not careful. It's just all over the place. Big files, you have to make good folder structure for those. And we're going to talk about that next week. Um, so I think I think that's it. Just watch those. Watch at least that nine photo composition tips, rules of framing and composition, that video, they're both good. The first one's only three minutes. The second one's like eight minutes. So give yourself a chance and watch those composition leading lines. I'm going to talk about it more next week too, because that's part of perspective. Um, so, okay, enough of this. Uh, is, I think we're okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions or comments or anything? Are we going to critique this stuff next week? Okay, good question. Do we critique? I, I have never had where I do like, let's lay everybody else, everybody's photos out one at a time and let's all talk about it. Not because I'm against it, but just because of a t of the time, okay, involved in that. Um, I've always said we could do that on Thursdays if we wanted to. But what I like to do is instead, and I'll, I'll read yours in a second, Ann. What I like to do is every week, what I will do, and I choose different students every week, is I'll choose one or two students, some of their work that they've done, and we'll talk about it, right? I'll show them and we'll talk about it and have input that way. But as far as critiques go, it's generally, I look at your work, I give you a grade, and I'll individually write on certain photos. And definitely at the end of your photos on your 10th photo, I tell you, you know, this is good, this is good, this might do some work, that kind of thing. But as far as group critiques go with every student in the class and looking at all 10 of everybody's, I've never, I don't do that. If, if that's an issue for you, we can, we can meet up and I can individually, we could look at stuff, but I just do it because it, it becomes a very time consuming process. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Do, do you think that's important? Cause I've asked students this, like I said, I I do have critiques where we will be looking at students, other your your fellow students work in this class as we progress. You will be seeing it, but it's just not in really a critique format. Right. Yeah, that should be fine. Okay, okay, okay. And then Ann says, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ann, I'm just I know it's a direct message, but it seems like it's a okay question. She says, It'll I know it'll depend on light reading for each photo setting, but do you have a standard ISO setting as a starting suggestion? So a lot of you don't know what that means, ISO, but I, I do. Um, for here's for outdoors, okay? Then you can write this down. If you if you don't know what the hell you're, I'm talking about right now, don't worry. Um, so you don't need to even write it down. For outdoors on a in daytime ISO, keep it low. That's the little rhyme. Everybody says 200 ISO outdoors daylight. When you go indoors, 
the ISO should be 400 to 800, even sometimes up to 1600, okay? Indoors, 400 to 800 ISO. Nighttime, if it's dark and you're indoors, it can go up to 3200, okay? So there's a big range there, but I would keep your, the, the, the rule with ISO, and we talk about this more, trust me, is ISO keep it low, but you can't always have it low when there's not enough light. You have to bring it up if there's not enough light. So a starting suggestion, like she asked, is outdoors, sunny, like even in the wintertime, we'd all say right now, yeah, it's so it's, it's not brighter. It's not sunny. It's still bright as hell out there. Trust me. Like it's even brighter in the wintertime because of that snow, like just beats the beams of sunlight right off of it. It's actually brighter in the winter a lot of times than it is in the summer. Um, so if you're outdoors, daytime, 200 ISO. Indoors, 400 to 800. Indoors and it's dark, 1600 to 3200. Okay. And yeah, it can vary. But the other thing I will tell you this, Anne, is try to keep your aperture at five, six. Okay. Try to keep your aperture at five, six or four, if you can get it or three, five. Okay. Right now. And I know a lot of you don't know what that means either. And that's okay. But if you do right now, when you're shooting, keep your aperture as big as you possibly can, which is five, six on a lot of your entry level cameras. So five, six is fine. Don't go to F16 or F22 or F11, because you're really going to hurt yourself on exposure. So the lowest ISO you can go, depending on the light, big aperture at five, six, and then your shutter speed is always the control at the end. And I mean that the order of operations is this, and I talk about this a lot. ISO first, first thing you pick. ISO, aperture second, shutter speed last. The shutter speed is the dial that dials it in. The shutter speed is the last thing that really get that exposure dialed into where you want it. It doesn't really matter what the shutter it does, but it doesn't really visually affect anything unless it's really slow. So the shutter speed is a great control for your exposure. ISO and aperture, those are the kind of things you got to make purposeful decisions on. So ISO first, aperture second, five, six, and then shutter speed. All right, for the ones that are going to use their cameras right now. But we're going to talk about this all semester manual operation of cameras. It's not rocket science. Um, you know, it really isn't, but those are the three things that you want to get a mastery of eventually. And once you do, you're, you're as good as a pro. I really mean that. If you understand those things, even if you're shooting in other ways, aperture priority, you need to know those things. You need to understand them. And I'll leave you with this. Like I've been watching a lot of pilot videos lately, and it just kind of goes with this. A pilot that flies in autopilot, they, they fly in autopilot. They use it all the time, but trust me without hesitation that they know how to fly that plane without autopilot, okay? And I mean that, it's the same thing. If you're gonna use an auto feature on a camera, that's okay, but you should know how to do it manually just in case you need to fix it or your plane's gonna crash or whatever. And that's that kind of morbid, but you only use the auto features for convenience, not for as a crutch is kind of the idea there, right? So, all right, I'll leave you with that. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, Self-portrait is not due next Tuesday, it's due next Friday. So we're gonna have one more class beforehand and that's when I'm gonna, we'll talk about Flickr and file management and all that stuff. And we're good. I'm very versatile and workable. If we get behind a little bit and weird, like things get strange and I feel like I gotta explain some things a little more in detail, I'll do that. And I might take an assignment out if I have to, to do that. I've done that in the past, but we'll see how it goes first, okay? And so far, we're right on schedule and we're good. So, all right. Well, thank you all for being here. I appreciate your attention and I'll see you next week. All right? All right, yeah, have a good week. Thank you all, appreciate it. Take care, I'm gonna stop recording.